Hello, so I'm going to live stream today, and I'm live streaming to my Facebook page, Hamza the Historian, and I want to talk about today, what is modernity, and it's going to be an introduction to what is uh, Orientalism, more or less, and so I'm going to talk about, you know, modernity from the perspective of trying to understand Orientalism. Um, it's important in trying to understand all the historical books uh, written uh, about Muslims and Islamic history. And I'm going to start with a quote from Edward Said, the famous author of the book Orientalism, and this quote is from his book Culture and Imperialism. I suggested that studying the relationship between the West and its dominated cultural others is not just a way of understanding an unequal relationship between unequal interlocutors but also a point of entry into studying the formation and meaning of Western cultural practices themselves, end quote. And here I'm going to read you another quote from Talal Asad, the famous anthropologist and son of the Quranic translator Muhammad Asad, from his book Genealogies of Religion. Non-Westerners who seek to understand their local histories must also inquire into Europe's past because it is through the latter that universal history has been constructed. That history defines the former as merely local, that is, as histories with limits. The contemporary history of political Islam has been defined in just this way. The European Enlightenment constitutes the historical site from which Westerners typically approach non-Western traditions. That approach has tended to evaluate and measure traditions according to their distance from Enlightenment and liberal models." End quote. So what is modernity? I'm going to try to summarize it as much as I can. This will be a slightly longer video. So this question is still hotly debated alongside such questions as when did modernity begin? Moreover, the Enlightenment was not a monolithic enterprise. With whom did modernity begin? In other words, when did the Renaissance end? and the Aufklärung, Enlightenment, begin. Frankly, I lament the trend in the Anglo-American academe to parrot Immanuel Kant as the father of the Enlightenment, often citing his article, Was ist Aufklärung? Was ist Aufklärung? What is the Enlightenment? In Berlinische Monatschrift. Okay, the monthly publication there, um, the Berlin monthly publication. And then Michel Foucault's subsequent commentary on it. Rather, I would posit that a more tenable starting point to modernity is with René Descartes, who died in 1649, and it started on the 10th of November in 1619. What Descartes does is define humanity or humanism as the deity and anchor around which all epistemological claims must be based, an abstract universality which became known as anthropocent anthropocentrism. Sorry. Certain knowledge is based solely on the Cartesian cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. It's a very uh, narcissistic way of thinking. And there are different answers. You could say, I think, therefore, God is. I am, therefore, I think. And so Islam, for instance, was strongly non-anthropocentric and refused man's domination over nature. Some have even said that the cogito ergo sum could have, could not have come into being without the prerequisite, I conquer, therefore I am, or ego extermino, I exterminate, therefore I am, due to the 16th century's inception of modern colonialism and genocide. Descartes is allowed to perceive himself as the center of the world because he has already subjugated the world literally. Perhaps it's also worthy to mention psychoanalysis rejection of the cogito as madness, alienation, 
and the cogito's failure to take the unconscious into, into account. So you, for that, you can see Jacques Lecon presentation in Psychical Causality in his Ecrites. The narcissism of self-consciousness, which is the locus of all external a posterior, a, a posterior knowledge, the self-affirming hubris has power over and freedom from all external objects. Therefore, nature, which is threatening and unknown, is dangerous, and thus nature must be reduced to the familiar contents of our mind. To do so is Kant's maturity that he beseeches us all to come into from our unnatural immaturity. In other words, both Descartes and Kant are prescriptive in what it means to be human. They equate the cogito and maturity with true human nature and do not allow other ways of being human that are immature. In other words, it's Eurocentric and racist. The non-adult is thus non-human. It is these ideas which characterize modern thought and go on to underpin colonial justifications via contrasts such as maturity and immaturity, developing, developed, progressive, primitive, civilization versus barbarism, and so on. It is Descartes who was a founder of modern discursivity. It was the Cartesian cogito which became the primary coordinate and reference point of modernity a modernity which has become hegemonic as a political goal. Quite convincingly and cogently, Slavoj Žižek observed that at the heart of the Enlightenment project was the injunction, reason about whatever you want as much as you want, but obey. And who is the biggest pill pusher of modernity today? It is America. I think, therefore I am, and whoever does not think is not I, but the other. Whoever does not think, that is, follow Enlightenment epistemologies, is not us, but the other. That must be subjugated like a natural object and coerced into Kantian maturity. Unfortunately, Zizek has often pejoratively called this decolonizing approach to the cogito as New Age critique, despite pre-modern indirect similar repudiations of the cogito. Zizek posits that the cogito, rather than being anthropocentric, involves the Copernican turn, decentering and reducing humanity to insignificant grains of dust in the infinity of the universe. Zizek claims that Descartes is radically anti-humanist, thereby dissolving the Renaissance humanist unity of man as the highest creature, the summit of creation, into pure cogito and its bodily remainder. However, was Descartes radical enough? I think not. Descartes' desubstantialization of the subject into a grain of dust still left the kernel of Cartesian dualism, which allowed the cogito by its very essence to hold onto its narcissistic hubris, stripped of all else. Cartesian dualism debased the subject into a mere worldly object, thus laying the groundwork for modern science yet simultaneously allowed this human subject object with cognition to be conceived as the owner of all natural objects, including other human objects or subjects, such as animals and the environment, are more objects of sub subjugation available to be exploited with no protection. Humans became conceived as property and as property had rights, but whose rights protected whom? Certainly we know of the case of American slavery, these property rights protected the slave owners and not the enslaved themselves. Along with the Cartesian paradigm, which would become the central domain or episteme of what we now call modernity, would emerge what would emerge peripherally and or underneath it was Western capitalism, Protestantism, and the modern nation state with secularity riding on its back. <clears throat> Even the eponymous Karl Marx praised the British for colonizing India. Modernity, that is, the gospel of rationality, is an ethical obligation to proselytism of spreading their version of humanity upon the barbaric, immature, developing primitives. They must civilize, cultivate, enlighten, and ennoble the human race, and possibly force them to be Protestant as well. <clears throat> 
Strangely enough, the whole modern enterprise is largely thought to have sprung from Catholic Protestant wars, where if religious diversity could be forcibly eliminated, so much the better. Lipsius argue, er, urged, if that was impossible, then religious toleration should be enforced by the state. In addition, there is something poignant about how betraying native informers such as Ayan Hursi, Salman Rushdi, Azar Nafisi, Ibn Warraq, Irshad Manjo, etc., and so on, excite Christian Protestant fundamentalists even now. Not only do they testify to the colonizer imperialist compadres how backward the other really is, but also how noble they can be once they adopt modernity's way of being. This betraying native informer plays a key role in making the inversion of fact by fantasy appear logical. There is no longer any need for expert knowledge when Ayan Hursi can translate the native sentiment to the West. This new episteme, Talal Asad, captured most eruditiously when he said, Modernity is a project, or rather a series of interlinked projects, that certain people in power seek to achieve. The project aims at institutionalizing a number of sometimes conflicting, often evolving economy, democracy, human rights, civil equality, industry, consumerism, freedom of the market, and secularism. It employs proliferating technologies of production, warfare, travel, entertainment, medicine that generate new experiences of space and time, of cruelty and health, of consumption and knowledge. The notion that these experiences constitute disenchantment, implying a direct access to reality, a stripping away of myth, magic, and the sacred is a salient feature of the modern epoch." End quote. It is this Cartesian cogito and Descartes' known passion for mathematics that were the foundation for the disenchantment or the alleged direct access to reality, which would be forcefully imposed on all those the West sought to dominate. Every civilization, save for the West, does not agree with this disenchantment epistemology and therefore, under Western imperialism, the disenchantment epistemology had uprooted and replaced many indigenous epistemologies across the world without engaging them as equals on a level playing field. Leila Gandhi gives a great definition. Colonialism, then to put it simply, marks the historical process whereby the West attempts to systematically cancel or negate the cultural difference and value of the non-West, end quote. Dabashi, Hamid Dabashi notes, from modernity to post-modernity, from structuralism to post-structuralism, from constructivism to deconstructivism, European philosophers chase after their own tales, end quote. Thus, the question is proposed, why is European philosophy just only philosophy, but African philosophy is ethno-philosophy? Afterwards, Hamid Dabashi answers it himself. The question of Eurocentricism is now entirely blasé. Of course, Europeans are Eurocentric and see the world from their vantage point, and why should they not? They are still inheritors of multiple now defunct empires, and they still carry within them the phantom hubris of those empires. They believe their particular philosophy is philosophy, capital P, and their particular thinking is thinking, capital T. While everything else, as the great European philosopher Emmanuel Levinas was wont to say, dancing, end quote. Dabashi brings this full circle in a level way when he says, compared to those liberating tsunamis now turning the world upside down, cliché-ridden assumptions about Europe and its increasingly provincialized philosophical pedigree are a tempest in a teacup. Reduced to its own fair share of humanity at large and like other countries, and climbs, Europe has much to teach the world, but this will now take place on a far more level and democratic playing field, where its philosophy is European philosophy, not philosophy with a capital P. Its music is European music, not just music with a capital M. And no infomercial is necessary to sell its public intellectuals as public intellectuals." End quote. With the playing field leveled, Dabashi invites his European colleagues to truly understand their European thinkers by studying non-European thinkers, where he says, On this site I wish to teach them 
Ahmed Shamlo, Nazim Hikmet, Mahmoud Darwish, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, in gratitude for what I have learned from their Heidegger, Derrida, Bedou, and Rancière. I wish to invite European philosophers to read these poets and not through the exoticized lens of Orientalism or area studies, but with the same attitude of critical intimacy that they approach their own philosophers. Thus I wish for them to join me in collapsing the binary between philosophy and poetry, to stand next to me as I show them poetic philosophy of our poets, teaching them how to read philosophical poetry from Nietzsche to Blanchot. If they read Shamlo, they will understand Heidegger on Rilke better, and if they learn Darwish, they will understand Langston Hughes, James Baldwin, and C.L.R. James in a whole different light." End quote. But how are post-colonial subjects, whether they be in Southside Chicago, the Bronx, Cairo, Mogadishu, Tehran, Istanbul, Johannesburg, and so on, supposed to move forward in a world system which has displaced and infected so many indigenous epistemologies? What is the post-colonial predicament of the subverter? Post-colonial subjects are a product of modernity whether they like it or not. Formed and molded in modernity, yet, yet they can subvert modernity, a dualism alluded to by Frantz Fanon and has become ubiquitous in post-colonial literature. Often, no matter how hard the post-colonial subject will want to genealogically and archaeologically revive the pre-modern past, one cannot completely do so without seeing the past via the lens of modernity. That is, there are always vestiges in our psyche and even our psychological imprints upon our bodies from modernity. So the post-colonial subject may try to revive the best of his or her ability, indigenous epistemologies, and subvert modernity from within, but inevitably the residue of modernity will always remain. In other words, many post-colonial subjects are thrown into ex existential crisis and become intimate with the paradox that what is eminently desirable through Englishness, a job or power, is also and at the same time rendered utter utterly undesirable once again through the taint of snobbery or the good life. To speak in the desired way in English is from now on to also learn how to speak against oneself. It is to concede that his tongue is warped. And that's from Leila Gandhi. Ibrahim France Fanon effectively applied his psychiatrist training and his expertise to say that colonial subjects experience a mass Stockholm syndrome, which leads them consciously or subconsciously to identify with and seek to serve the colonial agency. Hamid Dabashi says this is most highlighted by Mustafa Saeed and Tayyib Saleh seasons of or season of migration to the north, where Mustafa Saeed uses his knowledge of Arabic and Africa to tell the British what they want to hear. Undoubtedly, Tayyib Saleh was heavily influenced by Frantz Fanon, and the main character, uh, Muhammad, embodies this uh, existential Stockholm Syndrome post-colonial crisis when Muhammad attempts suicide, but digresses instead exerting his rage on the waves, swimming until his self-realization of volition manifests. This Stockholm Syndrome appears to be the driving thrust behind Layla Abu Layla, Layla's Lyrics Alley, in uh, which many of the pro or it's Layla Abu Ila Lyrics Alleys, in which many of the protagonists of the story strive to be everything modern and English, and that's a post-colonial uh, historical fiction book there written about Sudan. In fact, one of the harshest criticisms of Edward Wadi Saeed by other anti-colonialists is that he remained anchored and defined by a series of premises and assumptions that reinforced the very modernist and liberal positions that gave rise to Orientalism as a modern field of inquiry in the first place. That's a criticism leveled by Wa'al Halaq in his book Restating Orientalism. You can find that page 232 and 242. This is not without substantiation and was a position that Saeed was well aware of himself, which he called secular criticism. He is the one who essentially started the modern academic field of post-colonial studies proper, 
One of his brilliant insights insists that literature written by the colonizers during the colonial period ignored power dynamics. Where he says, when supposedly otherwise neutral departments of culture like literature and critical theory converge upon the weaker or subordinate culture and interpret it with ideas of unchanging non-European and European essences, narratives about geographical possession and images of legitimacy and redemption, the striking consequence has been to disguise the power situation and to conceal how much the experience of the stronger party overlaps with and strangely depends on the weaker. And that's from Edward Said's Culture and Imperialism, page 191 to 192, end quote. One stark example of this glossing over the power dynamics of colonization is the historical fiction The Kassariana Tree by W. Somerset Magum. While at first glance the book may seem vacuous, vapid, casual stories about white colonizers and their privileged woes, there are some other bizarre features that strike the contemporary reader. Firstly, the short stories contained in this book focus on the nexus of white colonizers' relationships with one another their dramas, emotions, and complaints, and coincidentally, that is in Southeast Asia, but, you know, ignore the setting because it's almost never mentioned by the author, except to set some sort of romanticizing mood or tone. Never mind the British are colonizing and oppressing a non-European population, just, you know, forget about that, and focus on these white people's woes. The text is fraught with white savior complex, where whites apparently do nothing wrong to the indigenous populations whose sufferings are not really mentioned, never mind the power dynamics, ignore the ethical discussions about colonization, race, or class. What can they know of England and who only England know? How ironic. Native servants are a fact of life. And for Magum, it was just a fact of life for the Europeans to have servants or hirelings just a part of life in the Orient or the natural order of things. In other words, Edward Said does hit the nail on the head with a great number of things, but what Halaq makes clear in his recent book, modernity itself is the target and Orientalism is merely the scapegoat to elucidate the problematic features of modernity. Similar to anthropology, Orientalists' main function is to study the other. What has modernity given us other than, and this is from Wa'al Halaq, colossal environmental destruction, massive colonialist and imperialist atrocities, and dehumanization, unprecedented forms of political and social violence, the construction of lethal political identities, the poisoning of food and water, the extermination of alarming numbers of species, increasingly worrying health threats, indecent disparity between rich and poor, social and communal disintegration, the rise of narcissistic sovereign individualism and sociopathology, a dramatic increase in individual and corporate psychopathologies, an alarming spread of mental health disorders, a growing epidemic of suicide, and much more. The list is long enough to require literally an entire ledger, all of which aggregately constituting a phenomenon that calls attention to a re valuation of modernist, industrial, capitalist, and chiefly, though not exclusively, liberal values, end quote. And that's from Restating Orientalism, page 232 to 233. To go back to my earlier posited question, how is the post-colonial subject supposed to move forward in a world system which has displaced and infected so many indigenous epistemologies to avoid the Chernobyl of our own species It is utterly imperative for Orientalists of the West to create a subversive Orientalism that provides an oppositional discourse that facilitates the change needed to deal with the crisis generated by the modern project. As I alluded to above with Hamid Dabashi's quotes, we must level the playing field and remove the epistemic superiority and arrogance that plagues the Euro-American Orientalism. We must be cognizant of the fact that the otherizing of Orientalism was dehumanizing. We must also understand that Orientalism came alongside Napoleon's army into Egypt, destroying indigenous epistemologies, education, intellectual life, and institutions, as well as the Sharia-driven central domain or episteme of Islamic civilization. Rather than oppositionally conforming the 
or confronting, excuse me, rather than oppositionally confronting the other and the other's wrath, rationality as theological, mythological, or metaphysical, or cosmological, and so on, we as post-colonial historians should engage with all human thought on an equal playing field. In other words, we have to engage indigenous non-Western epistemologies with our own epistemology democratically. Rather than dismissing them as irrational, as some do by calling indigenous historical sources as vague and conf and therefore untrue or irrational, or mythological miracles or legend, or that it's uncritical and biased, as if the Orientalist has no bias himself, we should engage the indigenous epistemologies and indigenous fields of textual criticism, not use power and privilege to merely dismiss the other as irrational and biased without democratically engaging our fellow human beings. And so that's where I'm going to conclude uh, this live stream video here. And I'm planning to upload this to YouTube as well later this evening. And then the next uh, video I plan to make related to this is going to be what's the Western concept of history and how do Orientalists as well as other types of Western historians uh, conceive of uh, uh, history, the theory of doing history or what they call in academia historiography. And thank you for watching.